Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. So, um, hi everyone. My name's Oscar Johansson, and um, as Lisa said, I am a research fellow at the Garrett Rufield Academy, and specifically its architectural design department. And I've been working on a sort of body of research, which is uh, called Usurpers. Uh, and this core question is really about the entanglement between uh, the spaces of maritime vessels, so ships, but also other things which are on the surface of the sea that aren't quite ships, and uh, spaces of the city. So how these two different kind of domains, these two different sort of spatial domains get entangled, and what that means for both. Um, the work that I'm going to present today is uh, like a, if you like an overview of the research I've been doing up until now, and it kind of contains within a, a few uh, intuitions about how this might begin to coalesce into the final output uh, of the fellowship. So um, I say the research is mostly about maritime vessels, uh, which tend to sit on top of the surface of the sea. For me, this means that it, we, we need to begin with a kind of uh, framework, a critical framework of the sea itself. Um, uh, the surface, its volume, the floor or the bed of the sea, and also where the sea interfaces with the land. Um, so a really important text for me uh, recently in trying to establish this framework for myself has been a, a, a text called uh, Capitalism in the Sea by Liam Campling and Alejandro uh, Colas, who make this really compelling argument that uh, the sea and sea space has been just as important uh, for the uh, development of capitalism as the land. Uh, there's certain Marxian uh, histories which, which would say that um, uh, contemporary capitalism emerged in the sort of landscape of England. They make an argument that sea space has been just as important for the development of capitalism and the particularities of the ocean and of the sea um, really have produced some of the particularities of contemporary capitalism uh, that we see today. So they say this, um, for capital the sea presents both risks and opportunities. It is periodically acted as a site and source of competitive innovation and experimentation in finance, technology, insurance, labor regimes, and spatial governance. And then they also say, the sea has been a major geophysical hurdle in the appropriation of nature through the enclosure and commodification of the sea. So what they do is, is, is point towards uh, something they call the materiality of the sea. Um, so a number of different qualities that the sea possesses which uh, impact the development of, of capital both on the sea and off the sea. Um, the sea produces risks which have to be adapted to and overcome, but these risks can also, can also themselves be commodified. Um, the distance and the danger inherent to the sea can be sources of value creation in and of themselves. And in attempting to commodify the sea, capital has always demanded experimentation. This experimentation has manifested itself in new forms of maritime vessels, for example, um, but also infrastructure on the shore. So stuff literally on the shore, like keys and uh, warehouses and docks and cranes and all sorts of things, but also um, infrastructure further away from the sea in what we might call the hinterland, warehouses and offices and that sort of thing, which are very far away from the sea, but upon which capital at sea depends. Same thing for cities, offices, bureaucracies, that sort of thing located in the cities, just as important um, for capital at sea as literally ships and that sort of thing. Right? Um, now I alight on risk and experimentation because I think there's a really interesting history in and of itself that you can tell or think about or read about um, which is the history of the maritime vessel as an instrument uh, for experimentation. 
Um, you can see this in the uh, the, uh, the Nordic Maritime Empire uh, when when Norwegians started sending longboats into the northern uh, Atlantic Ocean, colonizing Iceland and Greenland and the Faroes and parts of North America. Uh, you can also see this in the kind of colonial astronomical expeditions that people like uh, Captain James Cook undertook when he sailed to Tahiti. Now, his mission was ostensibly to uh, record the transit of Venus at the end of the 18th century. That was his official scientific justification for sailing to Tahiti. But he had a second secret mission, which was to go and effectively discover and then claim this great southern continent, which ended up being Australia, on behalf of the uh, of the British Empire. So um, there's a long history of, of, of experimentation. Both of these two case studies I just point towards, if you like, are experiments which are being run on the topography of the Earth itself. Um, and the ship itself is the instrument for that experiment. Obviously, there are other scientific instruments on board, like astrolabes and telescopes and notebooks and all sorts of things. But the ship itself is also an instrument for that experimentation, which I think is really interesting. Um, there's also a history of the vessel as a source of and a means of managing risk. So risk and experimentation, obviously, closely related concepts, but still distinct. You can think about ships as sources of risk, risk to other ships, risk to enemy trade networks, ship uh, risks to uh, communities on the shore. But you can also think about ships as uh, instruments for managing risk. So think about Venice and the Venetian Republic, which used its maritime vessels to monopolize uh, trade in the Adriatic Sea. Or think about the first joint stock companies that were invented uh, in England and the Dutch Republic, um, which were sort of really critical for the colonial efforts of, of those countries. Um, in our own time, you can think about the establishment of offshore drilling platforms, uh, which as, as the Deepwater Horizon showed us a few years ago, are by no means free of risk. And, um, or we can even think about uh, uh, even more recent events such as the Ever Given, right? These are the risks inherent to uh, the global logistics network, uh, which, which rests entirely upon um, maritime vessels, and the risks in pushing these vessels to their absolute limit, to their material limit, and to the laborers on board these vessels, their crew, their captain and their crew, to their absolute limit as well. Because often uh, these people are operating with very little sleep because the risks that are being taken by the owners of these vessels are being done so in pursuit of the greatest amount of capital accumulation possible. So the history of risk and experimentation at sea is intimately bound with organizations on land. And those organizations are helped by institutions and uh, bureaucracies that have the power to command and the power to deploy and the political and financial capacity to shoulder risk. And they're always doing so in the pursuit of as much capital accumulation as possible. Now, rarely does power such as this exist entirely at sea. It's always, almost always um, somehow based on the land, but that hasn't stopped a really compelling history of fantasies and dreams of entirely seaborne powers. Um, dreams of what we could call maritarchies, you know, power systems based on the sea or thalassocracies you know, societies which are somehow based around the sea. Uh, you see this in the stories of Jonathan Swift, right, writing about Laputa, Castle in the Sky. This is like a fantasy, if you like, of a power which is not bound to the land. But for most of human history, it seems as though if you're sending ships out into the sea, the power still resides on the land. So what does... To, I, so... Um, Oh, this is another really good example of an institution based on the land, the, the, the Dutch Bourse, right? 
Uh, and this is an image, uh, which is an illustration of a uh, story by Jules Verne, the great science fiction writer. Um, he wrote called Propeller Island. The plot of that novel concerns a, uh, an artificial island called Standard Island, which is the home of a number of millionaires and billionaires from the US, which kind of circulates its way around the ocean. So again, this is a this is part of the uh, literary um, history of of seaborne um, powers. Um, so, how does this framework for thinking about the sea, the relationship between um, uh, uh, vessels on the surface and the powers that control them based on the sea, the instrumentalization of, of maritime vessels, the fact that the sea cannot be settled, the materiality of the sea and the fact that inherent to that is the idea of risk and experimentation. How does all of this framework um, help with our understanding of, of, uh, of the most insane form of maritime vessel, I think, uh, uh, that's floating around today, which is the, which is the cruise liner, um, and ultimately the the subject that I'm I, I've I've moved on to with my research uh, most recently. Well, to get there, I think we still have to start, you know, in the end of the 19th century with the ocean liner, um, out of which the cruise liner uh, sort of emerges. Now, the ocean liner, to give you a very quick definition, in order that we can be very clear about our terminologies, the ocean liner is the scheduled overseas passenger vehicle. And uh, it emerged out of the 19th century when um, Britain and the US figured out how to attach steam engines to regular uh, mail ships that were traveling between the US and the United States. Um, the ocean liner conveyed mail, which up until the point that there were telegraph lines and other forms of communication around the world was the main means of circulating information around the world, including military intelligence. Um, ocean liners also conveyed people around the planet. So they conveyed uh, you know, the various different officers and functionaries that you needed in order to maintain an empire. But they also conveyed immigrants. So about 45 million people left Europe uh, between 1850 and 1914 on, on ocean liners. Uh, this was their main means of leaving. And this, this, this idea of exchange that's inherent to really big ships such as ocean liners ends up producing all sorts of really strange uh, visual motifs like this one, which is called the hands across the sea uh, motif. And if you like, this is a way of uh, visualizing the fantasy of a completely frictionless and always happy and uh, friendly exchange that somehow existed between uh, Western Europe and the Eastern United States. But liners, of course, were also expressions of power and of uh, the imperial powers that inevitably financed them, right? They always stood ready to be converted into warships either as auxiliary warships, like literally you would put a gun on top of it and send it into battle, or as troop transports, because they're really good, as I said, moving people around the planet. And the reason they stood ready to be turned into warships was because it, this was a condition of receiving the, the capital necessary to construct something so big, a, a condition uh, that was stipulated by the state governments who were giving private companies money to build these things. Um, the liner became so large and so complex that uh, very quickly we see these ships being compared to cities. So the image of the city is a, or the image of a territory is a way of trying to understand the scale of these things. But this is a trope which is also really interestingly uh, connected to another way in which we try to understand the scale and complexity of these ships, which is by comparing them to civic monuments. So again, this was this was an on this is an ongoing tendency, by the way. This started, I think, with the cruise line, uh, so ocean liners, in the late nineteenth century. But it's actually an ongoing phenomenon, because even last week, when the Ever Given was stuck in the Suez Canal, it, it seemed like we weren't able to understand the scale of the ship without somehow comparing it to. Um, other buildings. And I think really interesting is actually this left-hand graphic uh, 
the Ever Given is compared to the Titanic. As if everyone understands how big the Titanic is, we know that when the Titanic was built, it had to be compared to other buildings in order for people to understand. So there's a strange like tautology in this uh, in this motif, but it also speaks to the fact that vessels like this uh, somehow invisible or somehow unknowable. They're they're circulating in spaces which aren't known to most people, and they only pop into the popular conscious consciousness when um, something goes catastrophically wrong. So deep water horizon exploding in a ball of flames or ever or the ever given getting stuck in a Suez canal. And now that the Su now that it's been freed, the kind of kind of global logistics network is going to slip back into invisibility and um, we will we will need uh, graphics like this again whenever the next big maritime disaster occurs because we can't we will never because we won't ever, ever be able to um, apprehend the scale of these things. Um, um, in a way, the decline of, of ocean liners uh, reflects the materiality of the sea that um, Campling and Colas talk about um, because ultimately uh, the uh, the, the liner declined, right? We, 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 we saw that in 1911, uh, mass immigration was effectively stopped to the US um, with, the, with the passage of a certain uh, immigration act there. And then following the two world wars and the collapse of uh, Western European maritime empires and the rise of the jet liner, the ocean liner became effectively redundant and a redundant vessel doesn't survive very long on the surface of the sea. The sea is a incredibly corrosive environment for machinery. So if you don't have a purpose and there's no one looking after you, as a ship, you will very quickly find yourself at the bottom of the sea, even if you don't get deliberately bombed or deliberately scuttled. And uh, I think that points to the folly as well of, of this kind of uh, endless comparison of ships to buildings especially big civic monuments, uh, the ridiculousness of comparing an, of an, an ocean liner to the pyramids of Giza when pyramids of Giza is still hanging around. And I don't think the Kaiser Wilhelm de Kos, which was the ship it was compared to survived maybe 25 years, 30 years. Um, so out of the redundant typology of the ocean liner emerges a categorically distinct ship which is the cruise liner uh, and after a number of different permutations over the over the last few decades we end up with the sort of astonishing but also terrifying um uh, uh typology of the contemporary cruise liner that we, that we see here today um And the reason that I think it's really interesting to think through and about cruise liners is because uh, they more than any other kind of architecture, I think, especially during the pandemic have kind of crystallized uh, the, the ways in which we think about risk and therefore the materiality of the sea. Now, um, one major plank of cruise line risk management. So first of all, what I'm gonna talk about is uh, as I said, there were two different directions or two different modes of thinking about risk with, with regards to uh, maritime vessels, risks from vessels and risks to vessels. So what I'm going to talk about very quickly is the risks that cruise line operators currently face and how they adapt to that architecturally, spatially, economically, juridically, environmentally, what impacts that has on the city. Now, and then I'm going to talk about the risks that these vessels pose to terrestrial communities, the risks that they pose to cities and how that manifests itself spatially and architecturally and economically. So if we start with the risks uh, that cruise line operators currently face, um, one of those is being the fact that unlike the ocean liners, cruise liners are not indispensable to empire. So they therefore operate in a different register of precarity. Uh, if we imagine the register, of, uh, if we imagine being in the service of empire, you have the backing of a military state, but the idea of empire is inherently unstable. And so 
it, it kind of contains one register of precarity. Cruise liners up exist in a, in a slightly different register of precarity in that they are part of the tourism and travel industry, which is uh, intimately tied to the fortunes of the wider economy. So if there's a downturn in the wider economy, the tourism and travel industries are usually the first ones to suffer because if you lose your job, you probably aren't going to still try and go on a cruise, right? Or if you have to take a pay cut or, or that sort of thing, you probably aren't going to go on a cruise. Vacations tend to be the first things that get um, sacrificed, right? So one major plank of cruise line risk management is the maintenance of huge amounts of money. And uh, in this regard, it, it, it has done really well. Like in 2018, um, the cruise line industry was the fastest growing sector of all of the, of the entire global travel industry. Uh, it was worth about $150 billion. Um, and in 2019, the top three cruise line uh, uh, um, operators, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian. Royal Caribbean is the, uh, Matt is the owner of this ship here being manufactured, the Quantum of the Seas, almost like a giant Lego set. Um, those three companies made about $6 billion between them. So holding on to lots of cash is really important for cruise line companies, not least because that's what corporations do. They try and make as much money as possible, but also because it helps them weather downturns, major downturns in the economy, which will adversely in affect them. Um, they also have the capacity to weather downturns and risks from the wider economy by laying up ships or putting them in pause mode. So these are some uh, images that I've collected from the European Space Agency's Satellite 2 program. These are cruise line vessels which have been laid up um, as of uh, last year during the pandemic. These are cruise, cruise ships off the coast of uh, the UK. These are cruise ships off the coast of Miami. These are cruise ships off the coast of an island. So over on the uh, right hand side of the image, you can see an island which is called Little Stirrup Key and it's in the Bahamas. So again, this is this, this is only 50, 60 miles uh, east of the coast of Miami. Um, and then these are these are uh, more cruise ships off the coast of the UK, sort of down near Portsmouth, um, on the southeast coast. So this is another, this is not, you can see that they tend to cluster together because there are, there are particular, uh, particular circumstances which compel them to, to uh, sort of cluster together, not in ports, but just off ports in the sea. Um, they tend to lay their vessels up when, uh, when, when times get tough. But the other way in which they, they try to uh, recuperate capital is by firing their crew, which is something they're very, Easy, they're very capable of doing because one of the characteristics of cruise ships and um, global shipping in general is the is the uh, exploitation of what are called open registries or so-called flags of convenience, whereby you register a vessel not where your company is based, but in a nation that has a jurisdiction that is designed to be favourable to your kind of company. So this is, this is again, Lale Kalili and lots of other writers have talked about uh, this phenomenon at length. Um, but it's, it's, again, it's to do with the materiality of the sea and the particular characteristics of maritime vessels that they are able to move around and escape what um, Keller Easterling calls the inconveniences of location. So that's the economic strategy that cruise line uh, companies use to uh, uh, manage risk, part of it. You know, hiring and firing, using geography in order to um, make uh, the exploitation of labor easier uh, and uh, accumulating as much money as possible um, in order to smooth out the differences between good times and bad times. Complementing that economic strategy, there's a, a ruthless legal strategy. You might remember a couple of years ago in December um, 2019, the volcanic island of White Island in New Zealand exploded. Uh, there were 22 people killed and another 20 people like really badly injured 
people who were on that island were tourists and they'd been brought there by a cruise line company, Royal Caribbean, uh, who either didn't know or deliberately downplayed the risk of the threat uh, of um, the risk of eruption of this volcano. Now, um, this was this was what this was the end of 2019. So uh, there's an ongoing trial in which Royal Caribbean is suing the survivors. So not the other way around, but the Royal, but the cruise line company is actually suing the survivors. And a few weeks ago, when I was back home in Sydney, Australia, um, I'm in the UK now, but a few weeks ago I was in Sydney, Australia. I actually had the opportunity to go to the Supreme Court of Australia, where Royal Caribbean was suing the passengers. Um, the reason they're doing this is because they are trying to close down the possibility that any survivors could sue them in the US. So this is a kind of a, a, an anticipatory uh, legal strategy. Uh, the reason, the, the fact that a US cruise line company is suing uh, US citizens in an Australian court with regards to an event that happened in New Zealand and in relation to a ship that's registered in the Bahamas, I think speaks to the completely insane globally distributed uh, network of liability that cruise line operators are involved in. But some of the uh, observations that I, I made during the, the, the trial, uh, I think were quite uh, in, uh, quite compelling to me. I mean, for, exa for, for example, the difference between the lawyers representing the defendants and the, um, and the cruise line operators was really stark. On one hand, you had uh, a competent enough lawyer who was, you know, doing his job, but slightly nervous in, 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 uh, in, in front of the uh, South African judge. And then you had this kind of very high powered team from the Royal Caribbean who uh, obviously cost a lot, a lot more. So the economic uh, reserves of these, of, these, of these companies directly um, inputs into the aggressive legal strategy that they use to mitigate risk. Now, incidentally, um, last week when St. Vincent began to explode, uh, Royal Caribbean sent a cruise line, cruise liner down to the island to help with the evacuation. And one has to wonder how much this effort is to do with mopping up the PR disaster of uh, sending people to a volcanic island in 2019. I mean, I know that if I was, um, if uh, I was on St. Vincent and uh, a Royal Caribbean uh, cruise liner showed up, I would probably think twice about getting on it, you know, knowing the history of volcanoes. So anyway, there's, a, um, there, there's an economic, juridical, labor-based, geographic and legal strategy that these cruise line operators um, use in order to minimize and, uh, and manage risk. And a lot of it depends on the fact that their key assets, which are these cruise liners, um, are instruments on the surface of the sea. But the pandemic uh, ended up being much more um, kind of in excess in terms of uh, generating risk than any of the usual ups and downs of the tourist industry. Um, and I think that's produced actually quite a number of rather more dramatic uh, risk management strategies. So for example, we saw uh, Carnival sacrificing a number of its vessels um, uh, at the end of last year as well. This is asset shedding, I think, to use the corporate parlance. And again, this speaks to the, the globally distributed um, network of liability that cruise line operators make use of. So this is, I mean, if you have a building that you need to get rid of, you end up having to demolish it in the same jurisdiction as you built it. Right, that's not that's not true with cruise line uh, cruise liners. You can or any or any ship actually. You can take a ship which you want to get rid of and send it to a nation whose jurisdiction has been designed to be favorable to you, a jurisdiction whose labor practices are deliberately weak, in order to make the process of breaking up a ship, dismantling the architecture of a ship, cheaper for you. And that's why. We see shipbreaking yards in Izmir in Turkey. We see shipbreaking yards on the coasts of 
Bangladesh and India, right? So the pandemic uh, really, I think, uh, showed a, 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 an interesting dynamic that exists between the risks that, uh, that cruise line operators face, but also um, the risks that cruise line, like cruise ships themselves pose to a community. So I'm gonna just talk about that very briefly as well, because this is where the sort of spatial regimes of, of ships begin to impact on, on cities. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the, what I call the mania of interiority of cruise lines, but just as I speak, you're gonna see some point clouds uh, which are kind of uh, digital models based on uh, on on film, um, which represent uh, the interiors of a number of different cruise ships. Right. Uh, so, being enclosed spaces, which are really densely inhabited, and from which there is no uh, credible route of escape apart from a lifeboat, obviously, uh, cruise ships are really liable to spread infection. Yeah, they're spaces that are sold. On the pure variety of uh, of their program, so you have gyms, you've got restaurants, you've got movie theaters, casinos, nurseries, playgrounds, all that. Each one of these different spaces has got surfaces like countertops and tables. It's got buttons. It's got levers, like on you know the poker machines. You've got handrails. You've got deck chairs. You've got a million different objects which are touched by thousands and thousands of people every day. Remember that the ovation of the seas. The ship that took those poor people to New Zealand um, uh, can take it can have more than four thousand people on board, and its crew number is more than one thousand five hundred people. So these are densely, densely inhabited spaces, more densely inhabited than most buildings, and more permanently uh, inhabited than a lot of buildings. So they're constantly inhabited for a short time, rather than being sort of having a low density of inhabitation over a long time. They make a habit of stopping off at multiple uh, cities in succession, yeah? And every time you stop, you have people bunching up to get on or off the ship. So it's not surprising that they became the epicenter um, of the pandemic, especially at the beginning. You know why uh, um, uh, at one time, the largest case count of, of COVID-19 outside of China was on board a cruise ship. And I think, the source of this of this risk from cruise ships to cruise ship passengers, and by proxy to the vessel to the cities at which the cruise ships stop, I, I think is 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 in part to do with this complete mania towards this mania towards interiority. So a way of of uh, drawing out this this phenomenon I think is by looking at the uh, the private cruise island. Uh, what you see here, this is a, an island called Coco Key. That's an invented name by the people who lease the island, Royal Caribbean. Uh, it's real name, real name. I mean, it's colonial Spanish name or colonial English name. Uh, I'm sure the indigenous people didn't call it that, but it's its other more official name was uh, Little Stirrup Key. Okay. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, looking into one particular private cruise island, which is Castaway Key, which is operated by uh, the Walt Disney Company. Um, Disney is not a sovereign power, uh, but it and it didn't need to show up and literally take this island with 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 gunships. But I think it still, in a sense, betrays a a, a kind of colonial effort. Um, in the sense that uh, when Disney shows up and offers you money for something, it's gonna be very hard to say no. In addition to the tremendous wealth that they offer you immediately, there's the potential economic windfall that any state government stands to gain uh, by doing business with, with Disney. Um, if for nothing else, it, 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 uh, it, um, it creates uh, conditions for corruption as well. So. Although Disney isn't literally showing up with gunboats, there is still a kind of corporate colonial uh, effort that we can see taking place in the acquisition of these islands. All so these islands are being leased for 99 years um, from the Bahamian government. 
I say it literally doesn't need to show up with with gunboats, but there are actually often literally, they literally are gunboats in, in on the Disney islands. And that's because of this very strange uh, refraction of history and myth that Disney does so well. Um, and this is to do with the industrial romanticization of the Caribbean. Uh, so this is why when Disney acquired their private cruise islands, they renamed it from Gordaki, which was, was its Spanish colonial name, and they uh, they renamed it from Gordaki to Castaway Key. They invented an entire fictional backstory about castaways who got shipwrecked on this island, uh, placed this pirate ship in the bay uh, from their Pirates of the Caribbean ride. And they really engaged in a process that we can call, if you like, narrative displacement. That is bringing the island up to the level of the experiential, the experiential landscape that, that the ships and the, and the theme parks and the resorts are better known for. Um, while at the same time suppressing the local histories. And I think this kind of capitalizes, if you like, on a certain uh, colonial poverty of the imagination, uh, which, which deliberately tries to find in the Caribbean tales of swashbuckling and adventure rather than violence and genocide and slavery and narcotics trafficking and environmental degradation and the corruption caused by the intervention of um, imperial and more recently corporate powers. This is uh, this is Gorda Key, aka Castaway Key, in the context of the Bahamas. So the private cruise island destination, this private cruise island, if you like, is a crypto expeditionary enterprise. It reproduces certain asymmetric power dynamics between a very, very wealthy corporation such as Disney or Royal Caribbean and a sovereign nation such as the Bahamas. Um, and it's, it's an experiment as well. It's an audacious experiment, uh, getting back to that, that uh, sense of the materiality of the sea that um, um, Liam Campbell and Alejandra Colas talk about in their book, uh, which is that the materiality of the sea uh, really asks of those who would try and exploit it certain levels of experimentation. And I think that's what Castaway Key really is. It's a, it's a kind of experimentation. Um, but it's also, an ex it's, it's a form of experimentation in this, in this manic uh, interiorization. Um, it, 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 and, and the purpose of the purpose of which is controlling uh, passenger expenditure and controlling the experience of the passengers, making sure that the outside world doesn't in any way um, impinge upon the experience of those passengers. It's a it's kind of it's a means of uh, risk management as well. Um, I think this mania towards the uh, interior, this kind of fixation on closed worlds and uh, hermetically sealed experiences or experiential landscapes, this is in part why uh, COVID-19 was um, uh, so devastating for the cruise industry and, uh, and, helps, to, and helps to explain uh, some of the... Um, the reaction of the cruise line industries to, uh, to, to the pandemic. What I find really interesting is uh, the, the very first moment of the, of the pandemic where when the, um, when the risk of, of uh, where the, when the risk to urban communities posed by cruise liners was not fully apprehended. So the Australian state of New South Wales, for example, uh, knew that there were sick people on board the Rubik Princess in uh, 2020, in March 2020, when it allowed the Rubik Princess to dock into Sydney. Uh, and the interface that exists between uh, land and sea, uh, represented by the passenger terminal in Sydney, but also by the institutions responsible for governing ship, ship traffic in Sydney, um, such as the uh, Border Force and the Port Authority, the, the friction that, that exists between these two domains, which should normally be there, uh, was not appreciated and was not um, uh, was not utilized, and so the virus found itself smoothly circulating from on board the ship into the city. 
Um, of course, subsequently, the, the Ruby Princess was quarantined and then made uh, the subject of a criminal inquiry. Uh, but of course, it was too late. And uh, for a time, I think about a third of all COVID-19 cases in, in Australia were traceable back to this single ship. Um, so again, this is a really good example of how uh, the cruise ship and its mania for containing things only to disgorge them into an urban environment uh, represents a threat or represents a risk uh, to urban communities from cruise ships. Um, incidentally, the, uh, for its quarantine, the Ruby Princess was sent from the rather glamorous landscape of, of um, central Sydney down to uh, an industrial port called Port Kembla, which is just down the coast from Sydney, um, which, I, which I find quite interesting. The, the fact that the space at which you would quarantine a vessel is the space of pure production, if you like. So here's this gleaming white, but ultimately quarantined vessel in amongst the, the rusty and the dirty uh, oil and coal terminals of, um, of Port Kembla. As, um, so as Kampling and Colas remind us, the sea forces experimentation and during the pandemic, this was no different. Uh, uh, this is why we've started to see, even, even in the past few weeks or the past couple of months, um, cruise line operators trying to manage and then overcome and ultimately commodify the risks that, uh, that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic represents. Um, if we accept that a cruise liner uh, represents a threat to urban space, which is what the Ruby Princess proved, right, then it stands to reason that the only cruises that are possible now are those that do not interface with the urban, that do not at any point interact with a city apart from the city at which it departs. So in other words, a cruise that goes nowhere, and this is exactly what happened in December, um, when Royal Caribbean's ovation of the seas went on a test cruise, a cruise to nowhere. So this is an image uh, which makes use of uh, automatic identification um, system data. You know, civilian ships uh, by law have to broadcast their location every few minutes. So this is AIS data that shows you that trip, this cruise to nowhere, which happened in, uh, I think, December, 14th of December or something last year. Um, the ship left Singapore, sailed out into the open sea, started doing some maneuvers. But by 2.45, the ship had turned around because a COVID-19 case had been found on board. So the cruise to nowhere ended up having to come back into um, uh, to port, but I think what, even in its failure, the fact that the cruise line operators thought this was even possible really reveals to me a, a really core idea about the contemporary cruise line and contemporary forms of maritime capital, uh, which is that the, um, uh, the voyage itself of the voyage of a ship uh, which historically might have been a line between one city to another, is now actually a circuit contained entirely within the volume of a cruise ship. Um, the notion of a destination itself has become redundant. And uh, although uh, these private islands that I mentioned before um, uh, are billed as destinations, they're billed as somehow separate places that you might sail to, I would make the argument that um, that really they're just extensions of the ex of the interior of the cruise line, and that they uh, even if you get off the ship and you walk around and you go to the lagoon on one of these private islands, in a sense you haven't actually left the ship, and in a sense your 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 cruise is a, still a cruise to nowhere. Um, so. The, the, um, the obviation or the, 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 uh, the deletion of the urban as a destination in cruising predates COVID, right? COVID definitely made it uh, uh, imperative that, that the cruise line wouldn't ever call in on a city that it 
hadn't departed from. Um, but even before the pandemic, we saw efforts to remove or quarantine the experience of, of, of cruises from the city. And the Venice is a really infamous example. So, uh, you know, you guys probably know that in Venice, there's a campaign called the No Big Ship, No Grande Nave campaign. And this campaign charged that cruise lines in Venice represent, were represented threats. They represented risks to the city in terms of economic threats, right? They, these passengers got off, fucked up the city, then got back onto the ship and didn't spend any money. Um, they were a physical threat. You know, they created huge waves that disturbed the, the, the bottom of the lagoon and, you know, did damage to buildings and all that sort of thing. They even a threat aesthetically, right? You can see that there's a tension here between two different aesthetic regimes between the city and the ship. Um, and uh, I think, you know, not, no Grande Nave have ultimately been successful in having cruise ships banned from Venice. I think this happened last year or was confirmed earlier this year. Um, the cruise ships are still going to call in on a port near um, Venice, but actually that port is not going to be Venice itself, but it's going to be, it's going to be Maghera, which is the industrial port to the south of Venice. It's the major, major industrial oil and coal and container terminal of the entire Veneto. So I think it's interesting actually that like the Ruby Princess, whenever a cruise ship behaves badly, it ends up being confined to the spaces of older forms of production. And you have these kind of glittering, gleaming ships somehow being uh, banished to uh, dirty um, industrial ports. So this is a this is a vision of how the new cruise liner terminal in in um, in Venice will look. It's not in Venice, the city itself, but in Maghera, uh, just south of the city. And cruise line passengers, I guess, will take some sort of shuttle or they'll take a train or a bus into the city and the the risk from these um these vessels will be mitigated somehow so to me um it's a it's a bizarre but but also fitting conclusion to the development of the cruise liner that the ocean liner um so for, to, for, to the development of the cruise liner out of the ocean liner that the cruise liner ends up somehow being banished from the city altogether, whether by the forces of the city itself or by a decision undertaken by the cruise line operators. Um, and I think this is really a confluence of two trajectories. On the one hand, the gradual curling up of the line of the voyage uh, to become a circuit contained entirely within the volume of the vessel. And on the other hand, the management of maritime risk and the demands of capital, which drive uh, cruise line operators to make as much money as possible but also keep it from engaging with the city. Um, and as we're still in the midst of the pandemic uh, and the relative success of, of you know, vaccine passports and cruises to nowhere are yet to be seen. Um, uh, you know, I, I think all, all I can do at the moment is kind of just kind of keep track of these movements and build them into my research as I go. Um, but I think what I've learned so far is that the moment it becomes viable to incorporate new biopolitical regimes into the, into the cruise line, uh, the, the cruise line operators will adopt them um, as soon as they can. Uh, despite all the tremendously bad PR that cruise line operators have uh, created for themselves from the volcanoes to COVID-19 outbreaks, for some reason, cruising demand, demand for cruising remains extremely high. Uh, and so th there's going to be no end to a uh, potential material for me to, to, for me to, and I think lots of others to dive into um, as the pandemic uh, continues to unfold and hopefully eventually concludes um, sometime soon. So yeah, thanks very much. That's an overview of everything I've been doing so far. And then um, if you guys got any questions, very happy to, to dive into it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for another really interesting lecture. <laughs> I know, of course, already a little bit about your um, practice and your um, your research. Um, 
one thing I was wondering is like your your presentation really shows how um, um, maritime vessels almost seem to be uh, in some ways like the epitome of uh, capitalist structures. And I was wondering, like, do you see any possibilities for reform in that? Or do you see any cracks in those capitalist structures or like possibilities to? Um... Yeah, I think I think any uh, any attempt to reform um, the, the these these structures and these these systems that support these ships is uh, it's going to be very hard to do um, mm -hmm. in the same way that you know trying to uh, apply like a global corporate tax is yeah. very hard to do um, because there's always going to be jurisdictions to which you can escape. Mm, the point at which you can um, demand change and demand reform on these ships is, is uh, at the point at which they enter jurisdictions that mm -hmm. are maybe more amenable to reform. So, you know, a ship that pulls into a U.S. port uh, in, it has to abide by U.S. law yeah. for, for, for as long as it's in those waters. Um, if it wants to operate, uh, if, a, if a cruise line wants to sail from one port in the U.S. to another port in the U.S., it has to be registered in the U.S. It can't be registered in the Bahamas. So it, um, yeah, it, it, its labor practices and, and, and its environmental practices hopefully ought to be a little bit better than those who just register in the Bahamas or Bermuda or Panama or wherever, where, it's, uh, where the systems mm -hmm. are deliberately set up in order to allow uh, people to um, be a bit more exploitative. Mm -hmm. However, there are lots of loopholes in that system as well. Like, you know, there's a very small island out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that cruise cruise lines, maybe you guys know about this, they send their, you know, they send a cruise line from one port in the US out to this island and then back, which means they're technically not moving from one domestic port to another. And therefore they don't have to register in the US. So there's always going to be strange loopholes. Um, but I don't think that's a, a reason to stop and try and reform. Um, you know, no, no maybe, yeah. yeah. And maybe I was also wondering like, um, this is very much thinking about reform coming from jurisdiction and from almost like from the top, but is there, is there possibilities for re from reform, like from maybe from personnel or like from like, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> this is like, you are my first introduction into maritime vessels, but um, yeah, I don't know when the, when the pandemic hit, like on the mainland, I think a lot of us had a lot of hope for like new labor conditions or new mm. ways of like thinking about the economy, like the donut economy came up. Um, did something like that happen in maritime vessels already? Like really quick to be like, okay, how are we gonna secure uh, <laughs> profit? Not, yeah. not not that I'm aware. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the 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 COVID pan. The COVID is not the first time that like these ships have had to deal with disease, right? You know, there's like Nova yeah. virus outbreaks yeah. in the early two thousands. There's uh, ever since there have been ships, there's been the issue of disease breaking out, um, uh, but I, I I think it again comes back to comes back to the comes back to the fact that um, these you know I mean you've got you've got crew you got crew nationalities from all around the world you've got you know, the Filipinos are really um, overrepresented in in the global global uh, uh, seafaring uh, labor force, but you've got people from all over the world. So it's very hard, I think, to manage um, uh, collective uh, bargaining and, and, and organize, organizing mm -hmm. when everyone is split uh, all around the world. And, uh, you know, so, I, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the moment it seems like maritime laborers uh unionize um that's when that nationality gets cut out from the uh, uh mm -hmm. from the equation you know like uh, longshoremen uh people who you know and stevedores they historically have had some of the strongest unions in the world and late in and, and, and ocean liners were also one of the first places where you had regular wage uh mm -hmm. waged workers um 
but those companies which have got all these uh yeah well it's just like you know they're just being okay well we just won't employ anyone from the uk yeah. now yeah <laughs> because yeah. they'll just demand they'll demand benefits and they'll demand representation and they'll, you know they'll do, mm -hmm. do collective bargaining and all that stuff so yeah this the question is really one it, they're the same questions that are, are about kind of um uh, about the globalization and uh, the possibilities it's not particular to shipping i think it's more about yeah uh, the, the, the larger questions of offshoring and yeah. uh and how possible it is to organize across different nations um yeah interesting thanks there, i think there, there there is there is such a thing emerging now as a sort of environmentally uh uh sustainable or an environmentally sensitive cruise like uh, hertigruten i think uh is this norwegian cruise operator and they go to the arctic and they're, they're, they're tr in the antarctic and they're trialing like the first electric ships which don't pump out huge amounts of mm. pollution and which are very sensitive to the environment and all that sort of thing but it's not the it's not the majority by any means i don't think um but yeah the the possibility is there but it's it's infinitely harder than it is on land we don't have a good track record on land so i don't know yeah. thanks any other questions for oscar or uh, yes i have a question um i think it's a super interesting research oscar i really enjoyed listening to your presentation um and I'm wondering where for you, you because it feels like it's a very interesting topic where there's always going to be another thing to continue the research, let's say, especially mm. now with the pandemic and there's so much happening and you get so much input into this research, which is, makes it also very interesting. But where do you think for particularly your research is uh, do you have a particular ending in mind or where where do you feel it's going to lead you? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because the pandemic itself has thrown up all sorts of amazing, terrifying developments in the cru cruise world. Um, but it's also frustrated me from, from undertaking some quite primary research which is what I was hoping to do like I really was actually last year I was intending to to take the students um onto one of these things but obviously that to the extent that it was even possible would have been a very dangerous thing to do so we didn't do it in the end um so if the, if if and when the pandemic ends I think it would probably a fitting conclusion to it would be to actually go and actually try and um, visit one of these things. Uh, I think if I could make the entire thing, I, I could tell the entire, I, the entire story of this could just be the pandemic and how the cruise line industry has responded to the pandemic economically, architecturally, biopolitically. Um, and that in and of itself, I think would be a really compelling piece of evidence at some point normality will resume i think i hope i mean we hope uh so if that's how i choose to frame it ultimately then there would be that would be a natural end point and then i could take that singular piece of research and make it a part of a, a larger publication or something you know which is more to do with more generic issues of, of maritime vessels and space and their interaction with the city um but yeah, you're right. I could just keep going on forever. I think there's an there's an there's an enormous amount of research that I need to just kind of drill down into and um, present for now, just for the purposes of the fellowship. And I think just looking at 2020 as a singular case study might be one way of doing that as well. So, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the, the dream would be to get on, on board a ship, and that might be the work out if I've actually just been, if I'm completely wrong about some of the things I've been talking about or not. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you can make that happen in the end. <laughs> yeah.
No, and I also quite like how your research is really like mapping the different overlapping fields. Like it doesn't, um, like, I don't know, it's not necessarily a problem for me that there's not one question that that sort of guides the whole thing. It's just like little, like, I don't yeah. know, I don't, I don't really, um, but yeah, I do um, understand your question too, Ava. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, it was also definitely not as a comment. It was, I was just very interested to yeah. see where you feel it's going to lead you. But yeah, I, I, I also understand um, it, it goes in multiple directions. And you also, of course, the research itself, you want to um, see where the material is taking you. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 yeah, I, I really already find your in answer to that very interesting where you, um, yeah, might think uh, to also f uh, put it in context of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if it would be a publication in the end, I would love to read it. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think there's also something to be said for the unknowability of some of these systems. Like when you're just when you're in the middle of it, and it's like, okay, this company is registered here. We're talking about this location. This ship is registered here. There, it's like an offshore account. This is a history of exploitation over here. That, I mean, it's like the the um, superimposed sort of systems deliberately, deliberately. Um, hard to understand and uh, you, you know there's a, there's a certain element of the unknowability of the contemporary condition it's not just to do with cruises it's to do with with everything the way the way our world is is fundamentally structured so um, yeah to, to to not have a proper conclusion I think wouldn't be uh, the end of the world because I mean, to be honest, I don't think the pandemic is going to have a proper conclusion. It's going to be, it's not going to be a nice and neat conclusion, even after most people get vaccinated in Western Europe, right? <laughs> it's going to be countries that don't get vaccinated for potentially another year or two years because of this tremendous asymmetry that exists between the wealth and resources of nations. So, um, so yeah, the, the, the lack of a def definitive denouement, I think, would be uh, would be fitting for for the for the context of the pandemic as well. Yeah, I understand. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else has a question or a remark? No. Well then, thank you so much, Oscar. It was really great to hear you again, and um, yeah, hope to talk soon. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks, guys, for thanks for everyone listening. for yeah listening and coming, and um, I will post. I see this. also something in the chat. Sorry to interrupt, mm -hmm. but I see. Oh. Oh, what do you see in the Maybe. chat? Sorry. The chat. Oh yeah. Yeah, I just posted uh, yeah. an image uh, of a. Uh, building that's designed as a ship and we call it the ship. Ah, cool. Uh, it's in the city of uh, Ramallah. And I never really thought about it. It's in the in Palestine, specifically in the West Bank. Oh, wow. I never really thought about it, but, um, <laughs> but now I look at it really differently. But it's, it has always been quite intimidating, this building. And I don't, like, I, I couldn't even dare to ask what's in it. Like, is it offices? What is this, you know? It's, uh, I just, uh, yeah, like, I passed by it. But it's uh, it turned into this monument as well. Like, it's not a monument, of course. It's probably offices uh, uh, for business. But it turned into this monument. So if you're going to go to the area near this building, we call the area now uh, Safine, which means the ship. Mm. Uh, so... But it's also interesting because like in the West Bank, uh, we don't have access to the sea. So I think this is more like, I, I don't know, I feel like it's, uh, <laughs> it has some sort of nostalgia, but at mm. the same 
yeah, it's like we have access to something that we don't have access to now, or in some parts of uh, uh, the sea somewhat, but it's very colonial as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's not uh, very connected to the Palestinian culture, I would say. Um, like this type of industrial looking ship. Um, uh, but yeah, like cruising also is very common in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, on the shores of Haifa, Akka. Um, they're not like big ships, but they're just like, they just take you on a cruise for like half an hour on the sea. And the main people who go there are Palestinians who live in the West Bank who don't have usual access to the sea. Mm. So it is, it is usually times during this time uh, or like during the uh, Ramadan fasting month, like every Friday, there's some uh, uh, easy access to the sea for Palestinians so that you can get permits easily for uh, people, for Palestinians living in the West Bank specifically. And so, they make a lot of money out of that. And I personally, I remember like uh, uh, in my childhood, I this was very exciting, you know, it's like cruising in the sea or like just seeing the sea. Um, but it's also very common in Cairo. They have this whole like culture of uh, small boats and they call them uh, flukas. Mm. Fluka. So it's not a, it's not a ship, but it's like a, yeah, like a small little boat and then, each boat has its like character depending on the person behind it. And then they also have restaurants uh, inside um, like big ships, but like they're they're just there. They don't move. They're like on the Nile. The, these are just like things I was thinking when we were um, talking about it and trying to connect from what I know. Um, um, yeah, but uh, this was very interesting, and I'm 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 interested in the in the space or in the land, but I never thought about uh, the sea as well uh, as a capitalist. Also, uh, practices within cruise uh, ships. So it was a like a very interesting introduction, and I'm going to like uh, search more into it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's a, this. I mean, this building looks uh, completely insane. I th there's 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 two ways in which I I, I like to think about um, ships moving onto the land. The first way is like a purely aesthetic way. So there's like dressing a building up like a ship. Um, uh, so it might be like a completely regular building, but it, it has the aesthetics of being a cruise liner. There's a completely crazy um a hotel i think in south korea which just looks like a cruise liner on a cliff um uh and then the, the you know, this thing can you see that my screen yeah yeah so um so there's like there's the aesthetic of a ship but then there's also there's also the quality of being a ship, which can have nothing to do with the aesthetics of, of, of the object as well. So uh, Paul Virilio talks about the bunker as a um, as an object that moves, like the World War II bunker, you know, which is like you know the sort of ones that you find on like in Normandy. They were deliberately built without a foundation so that when uh, a shell hits it it can move on the sand and it can absorb more energy uh better so it sustains less damage uh, and that the fact that it's doesn't that they weren't building foundations means that over the course of the decades and decades have passed since the war these objects have moved around on the landscape and i think you can think about those objects almost like being ships as well or having a quality of shipness they're not on the sea but they're on the they're, they're like they're, they're still on a liquid but the liquid is sand it's not necessarily water so those are two different ways in which i think about how ships move onto the onto the land it's the aesthetic of a ship dressing it up like cosplaying as a ship and then actually having the quality of the ship not necessarily looking anything like a ship um those are two ways that i kind of they help me think about it and then the, the third the third kind of framework is uh 
is trying to avoid the word ship altogether. That's why I kept saying like maritime vessel. And like you say, there are these vessels on the, on the Nile or these smaller vessels and you wouldn't call them ships necessarily. They don't have, they're not big enough to be called ships, but they still, they have some impact and they, they allow people to inhabit the surface of a body of water. Um, and they, 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 they do something to the city as well. They, if, if for nothing else, they allow someone, someone to leave the city or re-enter it in a slightly different way. Um, or leave a territory even for a short time and come back into that territory. So yeah, it's, it's um, trying to think about the vessel as well and like what the vessel does rather than a ship because you know, the vessel is what, you know, has a vessel as a, as a means of circulation. Like that's why we have, that's why the veins and the arms are called blood vessels, right? Because they can, they allow a certain kind of circulation of people Usually with cruise ships, it's like capital. <laughs> and with c containers, it's like capital. Um, but yeah, anyway, that ship is that, that, sh that shipbuilding in Ramallah is completely uh, terrifying. But it is, um, thanks, for, thanks for sharing it. Yes. Um, yeah, and also this hotel in Korea, it's like. <laughs> This is when you know something really weird's going on. Like there is something very strange happening, and I don't know if anyone fully understands it. And not even the people who made it. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. Really nice. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Well. Yep. Great to present to yeah. you and thanks and thanks for your comments and responses any other later comments we'll be posting this uh on the youtube channel so you can also comment on that um and we'll try to get back to you there um but thank you all cool thanks guys so see you later see you around bye bye, bye, -bye.